Welcome to this edition of Opinion Central. I'm John Diaz, the editorial page editor. We are live here in the political kingpin. <laughs> kingpin, yes, welcome. Anyway, uh, thanks so much for joining us, uh, Travis. Uh, um, I'm, I'm going to share this to my page. Hold on a quick sec. Okay, let's, let's hang on because yeah, we're, going, we're going to uh, get some Travis Allen fans in here, I suspect. Well, we're going to get some real Californians looking at this. How do you think that? <laughs> now, hang on a quick sec. Let's see. <laughs> what yeah, we're, we're, this is live video, this, folks. This is, nothing, nothing beats the, the live, <laughs> live Facebook <laughs> Let's Joe, in the see. meantime, uh, we can, while, while Travis Allen is uh, getting his followers hooked up, those of you who are already there, the Chronicle today came out with its voter guide, which has a lot of information for that June 5th primary. So be sure to check that out on sfchronicle.com. And how are we doing, Travis? We, can we are about uh, 30 seconds away. Give me a moment. Yeah, the, this, the, uh, the fun secret is I am the only one that posts on my Facebook page. Really? Yeah, you know, I think you it's... You don't a, do it like, like Obama had a beat no, up after. You don't do a TA. No, you just, it's no, all no, you. no. It's all me. I mean, because look, huh. people, people want to hear from the person. They actually yeah. want to know what you think, what you feel. This is, this is the beauty of social media is that this is the direct, unfiltered way to reach everybody in California, everybody around the country. Yeah. So, you know, people actually want to know what you think, how you feel, what you're reacting to. And I'll tell you, you know, we just had a debate a couple nights ago. I'm sure we'll be talking about this as well. When you're in a debate setting and they ask you questions, you know, about the hospital worker strike or whatever it happens to be, these are all things that, you know, we've already seen, we're already up on because these are what all of our followers are talking about. Yeah. So it gives you a very direct reaction from the people of California about how they're feeling, what issues matter most to them. And, uh, you know, it really, I, I would say it, it gives you the direct pulse of what California is doing at any moment in time. Yeah. Can I just say, what, right now, what's on your, your social media feed, on your Twitter feed, is uh, a video clip of Willie Brown, former That's San right. Francisco mayor and Chronicle columnist. Uh, I, know, I, see, I didn't know that. that oh, you know, the, uh -uh. saying, him at the Commonwealth Club saying, you are the number one threat to Gavin Newsom. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. But you don't think Willie's trolling you there, where he's saying he's trying to get people to, to vote for the Republicans so uh, that uh, it could build you and uh, Cox up as a threat. So because he thinks we're in reality post, we're that, that, uh, that Dia Ragosa or Chung might be a bigger threat in reality to Newsom. Let me just reintroduce real quickly Please. because we now have uh, Travis Allen fan club uh, on his Facebook yeah. page. Yeah. We actually, we have all the California now. So that's sorry, a pretty big fan sorry. club. <laughs> real, real Californians. Uh, we are live here in the Chronicle newsroom. I'm with Travis Allen. Republican candidate for governor, assemblyman from Orange County, and Joe Garofoli, our senior political writer. Joe, continue. thanks so much and hello. Okay, no, so, we're just talking about. Okay, right now on your social media feed, we're just talking about social media, and uh, there's a clip of Willie Brown at the Commonwealth Club. I don't know when that was, last couple of days, or maybe it was today, saying that you were the number one threat to Gavin Newsom. And I'm wondering, is Willie just trolling you and Cox, John Cox, the other Republican running, by sort of building you guys up so? People vote for the Republicans against, uh, as opposed to Antonio Villaraigosa, who Willie really thinks is the number one threat. Do you think, what's your take on that? You know, uh, I don't presume to know what's going through Willie Brown's head at any moment in time. <laughs> who does? Uh, yeah, you know, but I think what's very clear is that, you know, Willie was making the speech, yep. and, you know, we've actually heard this before from a number of people, mm -hmm. which is there really is only one candidate on the Democrat side that's going to make it all the way through, and that's Gavin Newsom. Every single poll you see yep. seems to affirm that. Um, and all that we hear is that there is only one Republican in the race. I mean, there's only one person that actually supported the Republican president, Donald Trump, uh, the entire way. There's only one person that has, you know, a massive organic following. We have 40,000 volunteers from across the state. Uh, half a million people probably watching us right now on, on Facebook as we speak. And they know, whether it's Willie or whoever else, that there really is a, a very real part of California that spans the entire state that is fed up with how their state's going. They don't like the homelessness. They don't like the, the crushing poverty. They don't like watching their friends and family leave. And they know that it is the fault of the Democrats. And Gavin Newsom has really become the poster boy for California Democrats, right here out of the Bay Area, the liberal Bay Area of San Francisco. And there has been one person that's been pushing back directly. I don't mince words, I speak very directly. I tell people exactly as I see it. The problems emanate right here from San Francisco. They start with the leadership of Gavin Newsom and Jerry Brown and the rest of the California Democrat Party, whether it's 
Boxer, Feinstein, Nancy Pelosi, they're all right here. Kamala Harris right here from San Francisco. There's been one person that has consistently called you know, the Democrat establishment out and said that San Francisco is completely out of step with the rest of the, the state. And this is what we need to fight against. This is what we need to beat. And we must truly take back California. I think Willie Brown just has rightly seen that there's one guy that's going to beat Gavin Newsom. That's Travis Allen. <laughs> Travis, let me ask you about what you see as your potential path to a general election victory. You know, the other night at the debate, you and John Cox were basically trying to see who could out Republican each other. Well, actually, you know, I think John was trying to do that. I was, you know, oh, okay, just well, correcting let, let the me record, fin- if let you me, will. Not Fox News. Let me finish my, <laughs> my question here. Um, I looked at the issues that you were arguing about, things like the border wall, and you both want to build it, sanctuary cities, you want to get rid of it, climate change, you're, uh, you're both uh, very skeptical of. The Republican registration right now is 25 percent. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if you are able to get get in the top two, how does that 25 percent become 50 percent plus one? What are the issues that you can use to appeal to people who are voting Democrat increasingly? So, look, I think the issue is the same regardless of political party. You know, and we just talked about it a moment ago. When you take a look and you say, when I was growing up in the state of California, I'm California born and raised. We had the best schools. We had the best water system. We had the best roads in the entire nation. Now they're all among the worst. Our roads are second worst in the country with the worst traffic in the nation. Our schools are so bad that our kids are 46th and 47th in reading and math. And our water system, which used to be the pride of the nation, is now so old and crumbling that when it rains, it bursts Oroville Dam, 188,000 Californians have to get evacuated. And all the water that we saved washed out right here under the Golden Gate Bridge. Californians know that with this exploding homelessness, this rising violent crime, uh, with this intense poverty where one in five Californians lives below the poverty line, they know that there's real problems. And you don't have to look very deeply to understand that for 39 of the last 40 years, the California Democrats have controlled both houses of the state legislature, the Senate and the Assembly. So if you don't like the nation's highest taxes, worst roads, and you know always being stuck in these perennial droughts where the governor won't build any new water storage, blame the Democrats, because that's exactly the political party that's done that. So that's the first step, which is, I don't think there's partisanship to this. I think there's just logic. You take a look, and it's very plain to see that the Democrats have run the state into the ground. The second thing is you need to look at the voters of California. I think the California Democrats have it entirely wrong. The California Democrats believe that the voters of California are not intelligent enough to add you know, two plus two and, and ensure that it equals four. In 2014, Jerry Brown got elected with 4.3 million votes. In 2016, everybody knows that Donald Trump didn't get as many votes as Hillary Clinton. But the important fact is he got 4.4 million votes in 2016. Literally, all we have to do is turn out the Trump voters and all the disaffected Democrats and Travis Allen will be the next governor of the state of California. You know, it's interesting when you talk about the roads, the schools, and, and the water systems. Those were the results of public investments by a very liberal governor named uh, Pat Brown, yes. uh, Jerry's, Jerry's father, in the 1960s. I mean, doesn't that suggest that maybe public investment was a key to our prosperity? So this is a very important distinction to make. Look, if Jerry Brown had just taken a page out of his father's playbook, he would have been a dramatically better governor. You see, Pat Brown did raise taxes and you know he passed bonds and, and he increased costs in California. But the difference was, is he actually delivered something for that money. You know, we got the, we got the, the highway system. We got the California State Water Project. He even built, you know, California State Universities. The problem is, is Jerry Brown has raised our taxes and he's given us nothing to show for it. Jerry Brown has an abject record of failure in California. Four terms in office and Californians are worse off. The problem is this, Jerry Brown is going to leave office here in just a couple months. That's not the problem. That's the good thing. The problem is that when he's left office, when he started in 2010 for his second go around, the general fund budget was $86 billion. Today, the general fund stands at over $131 billion. That's an increase of $45 billion over 50% with nothing to show for it. Those Delta tunnels will never get built and his high speed rail to nowhere also will never, ever get built. I mean, all we have right now is one section in the middle of an empty field in the middle of Central Valley. And I will tell you, you may have heard me say this before, you know, in my very first budget as governor of the state of California, I'm going to defund high-speed rail entirely, but we are going to leave that one section standing, that, that bridge in the middle of that empty field, and I'm going to hang a sign on it, and the sign's going to read, Jerry Brown's Legacy. So no one ever forgets that's the best that Jerry Brown ever did for California. So you're, you're heavy on the critique of San Francisco and, and, and such, but you also have an idea about what to do with the homeless. 
And you, you sort of want to bring back the larger institutions of talking about institutionalizing the homeless folks and people who are mentally ill. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Then we'll let's you know break that down. Because you you know that you said you're concerned. Well, there's a lot of people on the street, and you would you would want to get rid of them and put them somewhere. Well, no, not not get rid of them. Not Look, get rid of them, but, you know, but let, let's be let's be clear. California has the worst homelessness in the entire nation. Our homeless population has exploded. People are dying of hepatitis in the streets of San Diego. There's 58,000 people sleeping out on the streets every single night in Antonio Villaraigosa's Los Angeles. By the way, that number went up by over 23% last year alone. And here in San Francisco, I just got out of my car. Your streets stink here. I mean, literally, it smells in the city. And the reason is you have 22,000 intravenous drug users on your streets every single day. There's maps of human waste so you know which streets to walk on and which streets to avoid. And you can attest that this is true. Little kids are walking to elementary school and they're walking over hypodermic needles. I mean, this is wrong. The sidewalks glitter and it's not diamonds. It's all the smashed in car windows because you have 31,000 car break-ins last year alone. And the chance of finding somebody that did it, finding the, the criminals did that, less than 2%. Okay, so what would you do with the homeless? So... So it's a massive problem. Now, let's take a look at it two ways. Number one, it is not fair to the citizens of California to have these, these filthy streets and homelessness everywhere. Number two, it is not fair to the homeless people themselves. These are, very, these are our most vulnerable Californians. It's not fair to let them simply lie on our sidewalks, under our bridges, and beside our roads. It, it's, it's a crime to them. It's a crime to us. Step one is we have laws. We have laws against vagrancy, against loitering, against public camping. Number one, as your next governor of the state of California, we enforce those laws. I stand up to the ACLU and all the other groups that want to stop these cities from enforcing anti-vagrancy laws, and we ensure that we can clean up our streets. Number two, if anybody is here in California on our streets that is not a California resident, they get a one-way ticket out of our state. We are not providing for people that are not California residents. Number three, if you can no longer provide a roof over your head and you can't take care of yourself, one will be provided for you. These will be statewide institutions. These are This problem is much larger than any one city or any one county can handle on their own. And also remember, if, if one city did it, they'll just move on to the next city. And it does nothing to solve the problem. It must be done at the state level. Where would you put them? So this is what we'll talk about. Statewide institutions where people that have mental health problems can get the help that they need. People that have substance abuse problems can get the help that they need. For the people that just need a roof over their head so they can get you know a leg up and get that job and back into the workforce, that will be provided as well. But they will no longer be allowed on our streets. So people will not be forced into these, but they will not be allowed to sleep out on the streets. It's very simple. Now, California used to do this years and years ago. The problem was is we didn't do it well as a state. It, these, these institutions were not being run well. Many of these people were simply being warehoused. That will never happen again. These facilities will be clean, they'll be safe, they'll be efficient, and they will be monitored so they are accountable. But no longer are we going to allow Californians to simply you know, lie on our sidewalks and sleep and live on the side of our roads. It's not humane to them, it is not fair to us. How would you pay for that? That is ex very expensive. All the experts say it's much cheaper, uh, should I say less expensive, to uh, house people at the local level, um, and it's better for them medically. How would you, first of all, how would you pay for that? Uh, number one, it's, those estimates are wrong. And number two, it's not better for them medically. I mean, you can see the homeless population today and these people are not doing very well at all. I mean, I just drove into San Francisco right now. I can't, I didn't even count the number of homeless people I saw. Right. These people are not in good shape right. and they're not being taken care of. So the answer is, is that California has more tax revenues than it ever has at any time in its history. There is plenty of money to take care of this. And the real issue is the cost of not taking care of this is dramatically higher than just fixing the problem. These are the people that end up committing crimes, they end up in our, our criminal justice system. These are the problems that end up, you know, uh, filling up our emergency rooms, costing our system in, in many other ways. And think about this, at what price do we put, or what price do we put on our peace of mind? Are you married? I am. You are married, are you married? No. Okay, would you feel safe to allow your wife to walk down on these streets right below this building she does it at 12 30 at night she does all the time okay well i'll, 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 I'll tell you right now <laughs> i know okay. a ton of people that live in the city yeah. and they won't walk in the city sure they sure. don't want their significance other walking around no doubt and this, but, this so is how would problem. you pay for it how would you pay for it? uh we we have plenty of existing state revenues so right now we simply state, do you have an existing estimate of how much this plan would cost um no we'll, we'll have to look at the cost i mean clearly the cost will have to be in line will have to be monitored we must run the state like a business but the cost of what we are doing right now 
are astronomical. And the cost to society is something that we cannot bear because this population in California of homelessness rose by 13.7% last year alone. It's so bad in San Francisco, you guys are gonna open up two new heroin injection centers in the city in July of this year. It's only getting worse. And what about uh, when you say stand up to the ACLU? What would that mean? Because they're, they're, the ACLU and other uh, civil rights organizations saying this is a civil rights issue to, to incarcerate <laughs> people like, or, or institutionalize people against their will. How would you, okay, well, you say that? Okay, well, let's be mean? very clear. Only criminals get incarcerated, yeah, right? And, and, and yeah. people that are, are you know, being put into an institution, the, one, the only people that would, be, would have to go there are the ones that cannot take care of themselves because you cannot have people out on your streets. What we need is a governor that is willing to stand up to the ACLU, go to court and fight the lawsuits for the people of California. This is what's been so sad. Look, the ACLU takes a ton of money from George Soros and many others across the country. These guys want to essentially take the people of California for a ride. They want to not allow us to enforce our laws and all of these cities are too scared to stand up to them because every time they go to court, they lose because the ACLU is funded with hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. This is an issue that the state has taken. They don't have billions of dollars. Well, I, 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 I would have to take a look at their finances, <laughs> but I, I will guarantee they, they got hundreds of millions of dollars <laughs> and it comes from George Soros as well. And, and who's also backing Gavin Newsom, no surprise. So the key is, is that you need a governor that's willing to go to court and actually fight for the people of California. Let, and, and that's what we've not had for decades now. Let me ask you about Sanctuary City. Yeah. The other night at the debate, you invoked the name of Kate Steinle. Uh, I've had a number of conversations with that family, including uh, her parents and her brother, uh, including on the day that her accused killer was, uh, was basically acquitted. Acquitted, yeah. The thing that would it make a difference to you that that family really resents when Donald Trump and other politicians invoke her name, that they feel that they're being re-victimized and their feeling is that Kate Steinle would be a supporter of Sanctuary City. Uh, Wait, did, that, did they actually say that? They said that John, and on John the talked record. To I talked he to them. The I, I, I would I mean, be surprised. Would you, After have losing you court to, twice, I'd have be you, surprised. Have you talked to the family? No, I have not, but this is what's really I mean, important. But, but let me ask you, just as a, not just as a politician, but as a human being. Yes. If you knew that that hurts the family, that when they have uh, her name invoked on TV, would that change whether you use that for political not purposes? Not in the slightest. Not, would, not in the slightest. Not, not even for a moment. Absolutely not. You don't care what the family thinks? Oh, no. I, I care deeply about the family. As a matter of fact, I, I would contend that, that you should also care about what happens with the family. And, and the San Francisco Chronicle should be outraged that not only was her killer let off with a weapons charge. I mean, this guy got felony possession of a weapon. He shot Kate Steinle in the back. That's number one. Number two, the Kate Steinle family had two lawsuits and they were shut down in both of those instances. There's been no justice for the Kate, for Kate's family whatsoever. Well, I'm telling you, no, no, I, I, have talk, I have talked to the family in their home, the father whose arm she, she was uh, shot and killed in. It's a crime. And they really do not want to see politicians like you uh, exploiting it for your political Oh, no, no. This, uh, well, let, let's be very clear. There is no exploitation. The only exploitation is going on. That's what on. they think, Travis. Well, let, That's let what me, they think. Let me you be don't very care clear. about their feelings. Okay, let me be very clear. The only exploitation that's going on is on the part of Gavin Newsom, Kevin DeLeon, Jerry Brown, and the California Democrat Party that is exploiting every single Californian with these illegal, unconstitutional, and dangerous sanctuary state laws. Listen, the Kate Steinle family has been rejected twice in court in their lawsuits. They didn't sue because they believed that they were not wronged. I will tell you right now, I have not spoken with the Steinle family, but I guarantee you they know that that killer should have gotten more than illegal Webster's. Now, hold on, Travis, hold on. Travis, you wait. should read what I've now, written because I talked to wait, them. And let, me, let me finish and because And they have called me afterwards larger. to thank me for getting the nuances that are obviously being lost. I, I can appreciate that. But let me, let me tell you, this is much larger because you see, one Kate Steinle tragedy is one too many. One Kate Steinle tragedy in California affects every single California. The 39 million people live in the state, including myself, because now with this illegal sanctuary state policy, that has been put into place by Jerry Brown, that is being um, uh, continued by Gavin Newsom, Javier Becerra, and others, puts every single Californian in danger. It puts me in danger. It puts my wife and family in danger. It puts everyone I know in danger and everyone you know. Because now, what? and let's be clear about what Sanctuary State is and about what the whole Kate Steinle case was about. It was about someone who had come to our state illegally, who had committed crimes once they were here. And that person was released from jail and sheltered with our taxpayer dollars. Now, 
if the Kate Steinle family, you know, wants to be on the news, I that that's that's fantastic. But what you have to remember is as long as this law is still in place in California, every single one of the voiceless 39 million Californians is still in danger. And I have led the fight against the illegal sanctuary state. I was the first one to write legislation to defund every sanctuary jurisdiction in California, AB 1252, just last year. I was the one who on Fox News in January of this year called for Trump and Sessions to come to California and sue California, which they just did last month. I was the first one to have a petition with 35,000 Californians from over 300 cities right to tell their cities to opt out. And the cities that have opted out started right in my district, starting with Los Alamos. You actually went further than lawsuits. You talked about actually arresting Governor Brown, Javier For Becerra, obstruction of justice, absolutely. Libby, Libby okay. Schaff. What, yes. what, 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 first of all, how long is that list of politicians well, that, it, it, that it's, you want? Well, it's growing. It's growing. Well, no, look. Wanna, and, wait, wait and what would the charges be? This is the problem in California, is we have rampant lawlessness on the part of the California Democrats. And it starts at the very top. Let's take a look at Javier Becerra. Javier Becerra told California business owners that if you comply with federal immigration authorities and assist them doing their constitutional duty, that he would prosecute you. That is like a mafia boss telling witnesses that if you work with the feds, I'm going to get your knees. This is criminal obstruction of justice. That's a felony. And for that, he should be arrested and prosecuted. Libby Schaff, the criminal mayor of Oakland, the Democrat mayor of Oakland, got a call from ICE. And, and ICE said, we have 800 people that we believe are in your community that have committed crimes and are here illegally, and we are going to come and pick them up. She put this out onto the media. It went national. Because of her actions, over 800 people are still on the loose in California. These are people that came to our state illegally that have committed crimes since they were here. That is 800 counts of aiding and abetting felons. And guess what? Since that time, Three that we know of have already reoffended with crimes like spousal abuse and robbery. She is now guilty of two more counts of uh, accessory to a crime, felonies as well. So when, when you ask, you know, Travis, why would you want to arrest these people? Well, simply because they've broken our federal laws. And this is the answer. There is lawlessness in California. It is being spread by the California Democrat Party. It is coming directly from the top from Jerry Brown, Gavin Newsom, Javier Becerra, and the list goes on. And we are a nation of laws. We're a nation that has a U.S. Constitution. They have violated that Constitution. They have endangered every single Californian. Kate Steinle would be alive today if it was not for the sanctuary city policies of Gavin Newsom and the California Democrats. And how many others have now been endangered by the extension of those policies? She was simply the one that everyone had heard about first. But I will tell you, even that one tragedy is one too many. And this is a tragedy that affects every Californian, which is why I will not stop until we have reversed the illegal sanctuary state. And you may have heard me say, when I'm the next governor of the state of California in my very first 100 days, I will put this on the ballot in front of the people of California as a special election to reverse the illegal sanctuary state. I want uh, a couple of things you had said at the debate the other night. You twice referred to John Cox as angry. What, what is <laughs> that was, all about? Yeah. Yeah. Now, why is, what's that all about? He, they, even the camp, their campaign's like, what, what's he talking about? What, what is going on? Oh, you what, know, I, what's you, the root of that from, just, from, from your perspective? I, you know, I was just standing there in a debate. We were talking, and he just looked very angry to me. I mean, he started to accuse me of things. And this is, this is the thing with John Cox. John Cox is from Chicago. He has never won a political race in his life. He's run for president. He's run for U.S. Senate. He's run for U.S. Constitution. He even ran for county clerk recorder. He's lost every single time. His ballot initiative, which would put 12,000 more politicians in Sacramento, has failed every single time he's tried it. This guy is, is a failed politician from, Sac from uh, Chicago. And now he wants to go to Sacramento. And he has literally copied me up and down the state. So, you know, you may have heard my, my camp, one of my campaign slogans is take back California because I truly believe that the people of California have been forgotten and we need to take our state back. Well, now John Cox in speeches has tried to use my same, my same that's, line. That's not a, a He's followed original. Well, you know, hey, I just think slogan. it's funny that's, and yes. kind of pathetic. Yes, I mean, no, no, it's, it's, this sort of, it's yeah. this sort of beta behavior <laughs> where he follows not only what I'm saying, but all of my policy positions. And then, you know, we were up at this debate and he's, she tries to attack me again. So, I mean, this is, this is all these guys got because, you know, John Cox has a failing campaign. He spent $5 million. He can't even beat me in the polls. He's always within the margin of error of me. I've spent less than a tenth of what he's got. So he is paying all of his campaign consultants quite a lot of money to snapshot my websites and regurgitate my talking points. And when he comes at me in a, in a debate and he wants to attack me, you know, I just, I got to call it for what it is. You know, he's, he's just an angry guy from Chicago. You know, the, the beauty of being on Facebook Live with us, uh, Travis, instead of the debate is there's no time clock. So there was actually a point that you made at the debate that I want I would have followed up if I had the opportunity. You may want to expand on. Please. When it came to preschool and uh, kindergarten education, 
You said we do not need mandated full day preschool we don't. and mandated full day kindergarten so we can indoctrinate our students. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Okay, well, let's. Th there's two parts to that statement. First, we don't need, we need to start getting rid of the mandates in California. I mean, this is the problem. Lately, they just came out, the California government agency came out and they're gonna mandate solar for all homes starting in 2020. We need to get rid of this whole mandate concept in California. This has gone too far. It's big government gone awry. Now, when we talk about our kids in education, when I went to school, I went to California public school and our schools used to be the very best in the nation. Now they're among the very worst. When we went to school, we did not have mandated pre-K. We did not have mandated full day kindergarten. Yet our schools were among the very best in the nation, turning out some of the very best students in the entire country. Now our schools are failing. The Democrats can't even pay for what they have with these bloated cost structures. And now they want to expand this program into full day kindergarten and even pre-K. And the concept is, wait a second, if our schools used to be among the best in the nation and our, our students were getting the education they needed starting in the first grade and, or maybe in a part day kindergarten, that's great. But why don't we fix what we have first before we try to expand into other areas? And the concept that we need a nanny state that is taking our children out of their homes where they belong with their families to put them into school full days starting you know, before they're five years old and at five years old, I think not only is that a little bit excessive, it's extremely expensive, it's excessive, and I can tell you, I have a, a daughter that's in the fourth grade, and she goes to California Public School, and I will show you the curriculum that she comes back with, and this is not basic reading and writing and math. They are literally bringing in politics into my daughter's fourth grade, what grade they classroom. What do you tell them to uh, yeah. support Obamacare? And, or I'll, oppose, I'll, I'll show you. I, I, the, I keep the it on my phone. Cuts and okay, so here's in climate change. and uh, You nailed it. You're exactly right. So um, I was driving my daughter to school. I take her to school as often as I can. And she said, you know, uh, you know, Dad, we're learning to read. And I said, oh, that's great, baby. I know you're, you're great at reading. She said, yeah. And I said, well, what kinds of things do they have you read? She said, well, there's a website. And we go to the website and we log in and they have us read articles. I said, oh, that sounds cool. And she said, I have the login. Do you want to see it? And I said, well, sure, let's take a look. So we start taking a look. And there's a series of articles that they have. My, my nine-year-old daughter in the fourth grade reading. I'm going to read you the titles. Uh, here we go. We have... Uh, our Planet Earth, Taking Action, Environmental Protection in the U.S., from the Sierra Club to the EPA. More people need to learn learn about climate change. Uh, hold on. This was another one right here. Is Let's get to it. Is that a good thing it. that they're teaching them science? Pro, pro con. All children should get vaccinated in the United States. And, and here was the kicker. Kids can go to court in Washington State to sue over climate change. My daughter's in the fourth grade. Why are they bringing in concepts that have not even been based on settled science that are written by you know, left-wing journalists into a fourth grade class? Teacher reading and writing and math, save the politics for high school in a poli-sci class, but, you, but don't do, feed it to my fourth grade okay, dog. But you, and to, to be fair, you do not believe in the science behind climate change. You said the jury's still out, I believe. Well, look, so the correct statement is I don't believe that it is settled science yet. You know, we, we have a lot of people saying a lot of different things about the climate. All of these are based on extrapolations and estimations. It is absolutely not settled science. And this is the beauty of science. Right. Science is about proving something. There's a difference in science between settled fact and theory. Right now, there's a lot of theory related to, to climate change. And here is the real problem. The real problem is the California Democrats want to take their theories about climate change and turn these into tax structures for Californians, tax structures and regulatory burdens. So we just saw the extension of Jerry Brown's cap and trade tax plan. We call it the cap and tax plan. This is something that increases taxes on every single Californian. It's going to increase the price of your gallon of gas by up to another 73 cents per gallon by 2030 and the cost of everyone's utility bills by 10 to 30 percent over the next decade. They are saying that this is to solve climate change. Every single expert in the world absolutely agrees that we could go to zero emissions tomorrow in California, tomorrow, and it wouldn't even change global temperatures by even a tenth of a percentage point. So the reality is the Democrats are using things such as climate change to push higher taxes on Californians and excessive regulations. And that's where I draw the line. And, up, and on vaccinations, do you believe there should be mandatory uh, vaccinations? No, actually, I don't. Um, so You're when not I concerned about the, the spread of disease or anything. Like that? I well, listen. I'm very concerned about the spread of disease. When I was a child, when you were a child, I'm guessing we were all vaccinated. Were you vaccinated? I was vaccinated. You were vaccinated. Yeah, we were all vaccinated. Vaccination rates in I'm California were well over 90 percent, and they were increasing. When we were kids, we probably had I think had about 17, 18, 19 vaccinations, something like this. The list is over 70 now. They're giving kids, you know, 
15, 19 vaccinations in a single day. There, there is a wait, recent. Wait, where did Biden get it? Fifteen or nineteen vaccinations oh, in a single. Oh yeah, because they they have these cocktails. Right, well, oh, such okay. such is what I've heard. Okay. Such is what I've heard. Now there was a, a, an article that came out a couple months ago where they did autopsies on some kids that had autism. Some they had extreme examples of autism, and in these autopsies they found elevated levels of aluminum in their brain. And the question comes: Well, where do they get these elevated levels? Well, there's, there's excess aluminum in these vaccines because it excites the body's immune response. Now, I don't know, listen, I, I'm not the scientist, but what I will say is I will say when we were kids, we got you know a dozen plus vaccines. Now they're talking about 50, 70 plus vaccines and written into SB 277, it says that there is no way to stop the government from adding additional vaccines to that list. So very likely in a few years, it could be well over a hundred. We don't know what they're injecting our children with. We don't have the longitudinal studies to, that will show us efficacy and safety over a broad population. And this is the problem I have. Of course, I believe that lots of vaccines do tons of good in the world. Of course they do, everybody knows this. But listen, I have talked to so many parents where they had one child that one of their children had an adverse reaction to, to a vaccine. One person I talked to literally just two weeks ago said that their, their baby was in the hospital, they gave him some vaccines, before they'd even left, their baby had swollen up and ended up in the ICU for two weeks. Now, they have not since gotten that child vaccinated and their other children have not gotten vaccinated as well because they did not want to have adverse reactions with their other children. Who is to say that the California government should be forcing families who've had adverse reactions with their children to you know, an excessive amount of vaccines that, that might even, and, and we don't even know if there's a direct causal link or if there only may be a causal link, but to have the government force this on California families and hold education over their head, if these kids don't get the mandatory vaccines according to the entire schedule of the state of California, they can't go to California public schools, they can't go to private schools, and now they're trying to get rid of homeschooling in California, this is wrong. That's why a, uh, SB 277 absolutely must be repealed. We have to be able to have an exemption, at least a medical exemption, for these families where they truly believe their families are at risk. We're running short on time, but there's one more question I want Please. to ask you, Travis. If you make it to the general election, do you plan to invite President Donald Trump to come out and campaign for you? Absolutely. Great. C come on down. You're hearing it on live right here on, uh, in San Francisco at the uh, SF Chronicle. I would absolutely love the president to come to California. Listen, think about this. It doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or you just care about football. Donald Trump just cut taxes across the country. This created over $8 trillion of new wealth in our country. Unemployment is the lowest that it's ever been on recorded record for African Americans, for Latinos. It's the lowest since 2000. Jobless claims are the lowest since I was born in 1973. This is good in the world. It doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat or just care about football. If he put more money on your table, so you have you know, more, more money to, to feed your kids, clothe your kids, do the sorts of things you love, this is good in the world. That's what we need in California. We need to stand up for the rule of law. We need someone that's willing to put California citizens first and the needs of Californians above all else. We need someone that's willing to cut taxes, cut the regulations, send a very clear message that California is open for business. And I will tell you right now, someone that believes in American exceptionalism, leading from the front, and that, that the United States is the greatest state or the greatest country in the nation is exactly the kind of person that I want leading our country. I didn't get the football reference. Well, look, a lot of people don't care about, about politics, about right? <laughs> right? And so, and that's fine. You know, most ordinary Californians could give, could care less about politics. But the problem is that if politics will affect everyone's life, which is why I have a very simple five-point plan for California when I'm your next that governor. Was what you took so long. I know. Hey, well, I, I saved the best my for last. Goodness, my goodness. Po political. Was, was so Cut taxes, get tough on crime, fix our roads, expand our freeways with no new taxes, fix our broken education system, complete the California State Water Project. Every single one of those five points is agreed on by Republicans, Democrats, even people don't care about politics because they all make common sense. And, and the other things we talk about are reversing a legal sanctuary state in my first 100 days in office and finally getting voter ID in California so we can ensure that there is no voter fraud. I don't need to take the Democrats' word for it. Let's prove it. Everybody should have to prove who they are before they vote. These simple ideas are ideas that every single Californian agrees with regardless of party. And I will tell you right now, this is why I become the next governor of the state of California. This is why I beat Gavin Newsom. Californians do not want California to look like the streets of San Francisco. Californians want straightforward, common sense solutions to the problems that we can all see. Californians want balance again in California. And that's exactly what we're going to bring. And we are going to take back this state.
Travis Allen, I will let that be the last word. Thank you so much for joining us My today. My pleasure. Travis Allen, candidate for governor. Joe Garofoli, our senior political writer, and our executive producer, Spencer Whitney. For this edition of Opinion Central, I'm John Diaz. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. Guys?